Good morning. Uh, I would like to call our meeting to order. Um, we're going to get started in our second day of Yukon River Panel 2019 postseason meetings, and I'd like to welcome everyone back to our public sessions today. Just a quick uh, review of our agenda yesterday afternoon. We left off uh, with the Canadian 2019 postseason presentation on Chinook salmon. And we'll be starting this morning on any questions that carried over from uh, that presentation yesterday. And once that's completed, we'll move into our 2019 reporting for uh, chum salmon, both in the main stem and porcupine rivers. So we'll be receiving a presentation uh, from the United States as well as Canada. And then later in the morning, we'll be receiving some presentations around uh, environmental conditions both in the Upper Yukon River watershed and in the North Pacific, uh, Gulf of Alaska and Bering Sea. Just want to remind our guests that uh, there will be an opportunity for public comment and testimony at 11.30 this morning. And so for uh, participants that are in the room, if you could sign up uh, at the back of the room by filling out a public testimony card, and we would be happy to accommodate your preference of time, either 11.30 this morning or around four o'clock this afternoon. So we will uh, move right into, as I mentioned, uh, we'll start with uh, any questions for our presenters from panel members on the Canadian 2019 Chinook Salmon postseason summary. So I'll call uh, Jesse Treris and Michael Folks uh, to the front of the room. And I'll look to panel members if you have any questions for Mr. Folks or Ms. Treris. Yep, go ahead. We have Mr. John Lamont, uh, welcome. Uh, good morning, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, Jesse, one question on the uh, Teslin River. Uh, can you tell me or explain to me the escapement 20 year, or two decades ago, a decade ago, and last year, or the last three years? Because I've noticed, you know, I had a lot of questions on the Teslin, and I, that's one river that's dear to my heart because I'm a commercial fisherman. I fish at the very mouth of the river, and from... Uh, the early six, late 60s, I've been really conserving, so the other end of the river can get Chinook salmon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Okay. So my, my understanding of this question is to describe the history of the, the salmon as they, in the Teslin River over the last uh, several decades. Um, so uh, we've heard a lot of uh, testimony at these panels over the last uh, number of years um, about how uh, uh, Teslin Clinkett had in the past uh, had numerous uh, fish camps on the river and were able to harvest and uh, for their needs. And fish camp, of course, is a very um, important and integral part of the, the culture. This is where people and youth learn and, uh, and share their information. Um, in the past, uh, over the last uh, 20 years, uh, those fish camps have largely gone um, un, uh, unused. Um, and this has been because there hasn't been as many Chinook that have passed into those, those rivers as there had been in years prior. Um, so this year there was some very minimal uh, fishing done in Teslin, um, and uh, the, the harvest was the harvest that was had was a difficult one to acquire. It took a lot of effort to be able to get the fish that they did. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, the over, over time, Teslin, Teslin has seen definitely a, a marked diminished uh, return. Uh, being at the, the end of the run, uh, so to speak, um, they, they were the ones that noticed the, the diminished returns uh, sooner. They felt the effect sooner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. If I can follow up, do you have the numbers, the escapement numbers for the Teslin the last uh, four years? 
I don't have the Tesla numbers uh, right in front of me, yeah. So I can maybe take a stab at uh, responding, and I don't know if uh, Mr. Polks wants to respond as well, but uh, there was a sonar program that was operated on the Teslin River for a number of years. Uh, however, that program was discontinued, I believe, three years ago now. Um, so as far as specific numbers returning to the Teslin River proper, um, there are no specific uh, estimates of abundance over the last uh, few years. The only indication we have uh, with regards to proportional um, returns is through the run reconstruction exercise where we look at the genetic composition of fish at Eagle. Um, so from the samples taken at Eagle sonar, uh, when we run the genetic tissue samples for those, we're able to see what proportion of that run uh, originated in different parts of the watershed. And so um, as far as a, a specific estimate of, of abundance at the Tesla River proper, there isn't a number for the last uh, several years. Uh, thank you both. And for clarification, I didn't have time to ask my uh, panel member to ask that question, but uh, as an alternate, I felt it was proper for me to come up in case the audience is wondering. Thank you, Mr. Cochern. Thank you. Thanks, John. No, that's entirely appropriate, and uh, thank you very much for your question. So further questions from panel members on the Canadian Chinook Salmon presentation. Uh, go ahead, panel member Ragnar Alstrom. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Reese, uh, there was a, at least three slides that referenced the, um, the return to the white horse, uh, uh, the, um, the, the, the ladder, and and there was testimony or presentation that those were the lowest counts in the last at least 30 years. So my question is, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, um, has the releases from the white, white horse hatchery been consistent over time? They have. Uh, they have, um, I believe, in the last 10 or 12 years have reduced from I believe it was 250,000 to 150,000. I might need I might be able to do you agree with this Steve? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Generally speaking, yeah. yes. So there have been adjustments to the number of fry released from the Whitehorse Rapids hatchery over time. And the reasons for the adjustments had to do with um, the observed adult returns. There seemed to be no marked difference mm -hmm. between the number of, or sorry, when years when there were releases of say around 200,000 versus 150,000 fry, the number of adults returning to the uh, uh, to the Whitehorse Rapids Fishway was approximately the same. So, for that reason, over the last probably decade or so, the numbers have been optimized at 150,000 uh, fry per year. Now, that number is contingent on availability of brood stock. So um, if, uh, if, there's, if the return of adults to the Whitehorse Rapids um, uh, fishway is of sufficient abundance to collect brood stock, then the, then the stocking program continues. Um, if the numbers are very low, then the number of eggs collected is adjusted to reflect that low abundance, and that's to allow for um, basically natural spawning to occur in the upper watershed. Question from panel member Harvey Jessup. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm not sure if um, Jesse or, or Michael, I'm not sure who, who best to ask the question of, but uh, I'm thinking about the baseline f following up on John's John's question, um, we often hear runs as compared to the last five years, the last 10 years, and I'm just kind of wondering if over time that baseline is changing. And uh, I heard yesterday um, in Holly's presentation, they talked about trying to, trying to emerge uh, different methods and, and trying to uh, figure out if there's a way to compare apples with oranges. Or no, I guess that was I guess that was Zach's presentation. Anyway, I was just kind of curious about the baseline and which baseline that, that we're now we're now using. I'll, I'll have a, a, an attempt at fielding that question for you. Um, I mean, I guess in its in its simplest answer, uh, we can say that uh, we're, we're using the the longest uh, series 
that are available for any one system, assuming, and I think this is the apples and oranges issues you're mentioning, assuming that the, the, the program, the methodology for enumeration of returns or escapement um, is consistent. And, and for example, it, you probably what you're looking to would be the Eagle system where, for example, the plots that I showed started in 2005 because that was the initiation of the sonar program versus um, um, utilization of fish wheels. I mean, I'm probably speaking the obvious to you already, but and which has appreciably uh, is 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 uh, in, in essence you might say sampling and uh, a, a, a different cross section of what's passing through uh, the, the 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 system at that at any one point in time. And so you are, if you, if you to, to compare numbers prior to 2005 when it was a fish wheel based system to newer time series is a, a bit of a risky exercise. You'd hope for numerous years of overlap in any one of these types of programs and then you get an index or you know, a correction factor as it were between the two and then potentially you can look back to the longer time series. So um, I think in the, to quickly to try to quickly answer your question would be to say we use the longest time series that would be available as long as the the the, the methodology for that enumeration is consistent within that time period. Does, does that help some a little bit of clarification? I mean, it's not like we'd ever if we had 15 years of data available, it would be perhaps a very poor choice to con just use the most recent five years to. Con compare 2019 to the most recent five years, we definitely would compare it to the fullest time series available if, if it was comparable. I completely agree with you. Otherwise, you are at risk of um, slowly spiraling down. And if you were dealing with a dwindling population, you would be comparing against a dwindling average. And that's clearly a poor choice. Does that help a little bit? Uh, thanks. 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 So that that is helpful. The other um, aspect to that is in the, in the context of shifting baselines, we, we hear um, stories about um, many, many fish, uh, red, red colored spawning beds uh, walking across the backs. We hear those sorts of stories. So I guess, I guess uh, um, trying to um, quantify uh, science with traditional knowledge and, and how far back we go with that information. So if we're looking at, at baselines, is there any way, is there any way that we can talk about what may have been here prior to sonars, uh, to <coughs> test netting, that sort of stuff? So I think just, I'll, oh, I'll maybe uh, compliment uh, uh, Michael's question by saying that um, for the benefit of the audience, uh, Yesterday evening, we heard some discussion around uh, the number abundance of salmon, say, in Mitchie Creek in the upper river watershed. And uh, although the, we'll call it Western science records, uh, are relatively short in comparison to the historical timeline uh, where salmon have been present in that system, there are other, there are other ways and means to at least develop an approximation of the abundance of salmon over time. And uh, you mentioned uh, traditional knowledge or um, traditional practices. Uh, obviously, uh, First Nation governments and, and First Nation citizens have an oral history and, and are aware of the presence of fish camps, obviously, in historical times. And um, given that the intent of establishing a fish camp was to harvest fish, to, to meet needs, to essentially survive, um, it's, uh, you know, there is some, um, I guess, correlation with the number of fish camps, historical fish camps, and presence of uh, either fish traps or fishing activities, uh, and the relative abundance of, of salmon. And so we heard about uh, some systems where today perhaps there may be a few dozen adult salmon returning that historically may have had, you know, a dozen or, or 15 fish camps uh, located at, in those same areas. So again, understanding that a single fish camp historically may have harvested you know, dozens or even 100 or more salmon to uh, enable a family to survive over the course of the year, uh, if there are multiple such sites in a geographic area, it certainly does 
point very clearly that uh, the abundance of salmon historically, and I'm talking hundreds or even uh, thousands of years ago, was what's much greater than uh, what it is today. But Michael, uh, go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that, that, that certainly pro more than answered what I, I would have been capable in terms of applications of traditional knowledge, so that, that I appreciate that. Um, and, and, in, and if I can offer in addition the <clears throat> methods that we, ha that we rely on in science where we don't necessarily have a, 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 an understanding of what's referred to as the capacity, what, what spawning systems can, can manage in terms of maximum number of spawners. There are, there are fairly straightforward scientific methods that we have. For example, one very recent is look at habitat literally relying on geographic information systems that would map out uh, the surface area of available habitat for spawners and then and, and very simple calculations of where you do have spawner information, you could expand that and, and, and get a, a very simple number of what should be there, right, compared to what you're enumerating right now. And then the more traditional method I'm probably you're familiar with is what's called the uh, stock recruitment relationship and where we understand what spawns and then what comes back five, six, seven years later as the offspring. So there's a, a very a somewhat predictable relationship between those two things. And once we have that established, it gives us a means of also understanding what should be a, um, the system uh, should be able to manage in terms of that, that capacity term. So that's sort of from, uh, from a sci science uh, approach uh, in addition to relying on the traditional knowledge that you had mentioned. I, I would also Thank like, you. Oh. Um, thanks. I, I, I just think that that um, ha habitat capability might be a good, a good uh, um, exercise. Uh, I mean, you're already doing it, but a good presentation at some point uh, to look at habitat capability uh, in, in the headwaters. I would also like to add to this that um, traditional knowledge uh, and the you know the oral histories of the people and um, the local information, the history. This really helps to inform us as to to what what has been lost, and it also helps to guide us into what we are trying to regain. And I also want to, and I don't think it's it's completely evident, but that integrated fisheries management plan that, um, that I showed up on the screen yesterday, in that plan it also incorporates um, the tr some of the traditional knowledge that we have received or we have learned in that providing early access to the fish. Uh, it's it's uh, beneficial and very important for First Nations to be able to um, adequately uh, smoke those fish or dry those fish um, and having that early access. And also the releasing of the, of the females is something that is directly come from uh, First Nation uh, traditional knowledge as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any further questions from panel members? Not seeing any. Uh, thank you, Mr. Harris, Mr. Folks. Uh, and we'll move on to our next presentation, which is the 2019 Yukon River Fall Chum Salmon Season Summary that will be provided by Mr. Jeff Estenson from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And uh, we'll be receiving information on both main stem fall chum salmon uh, and Porcupine River slash Fishing Branch Fall Chum Salmon, again, Canadian origin stocks as they're defined in the Yukon River Salmon Agreement. So welcome, uh, Mr. Estison. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, my name is Jeff Estenson. I'm with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. I'm stationed in Fairbanks. Um, it's an honor to be here in Whitehorse, as always, um, to give you an update on the fall chum or the fall season on the Yukon, or on the U.S. side for the Yukon River. Um, I'll be giving the presentation. I also want to acknowledge my uh, colleague, uh, Bonnie Borba, who is the research biologist for the fall season, and she'll be up here to be available to answer any questions when we get into the questions section. And then also I want to just acknowledge that this was put together jointly with our uh, federal colleagues, Fred Bue, 
Gerald Moshman with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So, certainly was an unusual year for chum salmon in the Yukon River. Uh, we heard the uh, presentations from Fred and Holly um, regarding the lateness of the summer chum. Certainly had some uh, effects on the fall chum as well and how we were assessing the run and so forth, which I will cover here in a little bit. Um, obviously, I mean, mostly for the most part, it was a good year for the fall season, uh, for the fall chum especially. Um, there were some, you know, obviously the fall chum returns to the Canadian portion of the Porcupine River um, continue to be an issue, and we'll be covering that here in a little bit. But uh, with that, let's get started. So at the spring meeting, we presented to the panel the preseason forecast for fall chum that we derived from uh, during the winter time. We'll be doing that here pretty soon, as a matter of fact. I'm using formal Ricker modeling, which you see here. And at that time, when we were at presenting in the spring meeting for the panel, we were looking at uh, expected run size of 933,000 to 1.2 million fish. As many of you know, we have a unique tool for the revising our preseason projection in the mid or in early to mid July using a relationship between summer chum runs and fall chum salmon runs, which you see here on the graph. This graph here, summer chum runs, fall chum runs, and this is for most years since 1995. There's a few years that are not in there. And what we've done is we plotted the runs for each one of those years. And we found that there's a pretty good relationship between the two runs. As a matter of fact, it's a bar squared of 0.8, which is a good relationship. So essentially the way it works is during the summer season when their season is starting to kind of come to a close, we have a pretty good idea of what the summer chum run was we can kind of plug it into here, go up, and we have a pretty good idea of what we might expect for the fall chum. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, that the late summer run did have an or had an effect on the fall chum, especially when we were doing our preseason projection. The main stem sonar near pilot station counts all chum as fall chum after July 18th. This is the transition date between the summer and fall seasons. Typically, and this is very common, we see uh, a mix of summer and fall chums during this transition period. However, in 2019, we had a large pulse of, of, of chum salmon to begin the season, and it contained a large number of summer chum. So what we're seeing with this graph right here is we're seeing basically daily chum passage at pilot station sonar from the 19th through the 7th of September, the number of fish. And what you're seeing here in the, light, uh, in the lighter portion of this is the number of summer chum that were present during those daily passages. And then in the darker part here is the fall chum. So during this big large first pulse that we saw at the beginning of the season, it contained an estimated 88% of the fish that were in it were summer chum. And this is compared to the previous maximum that we've seen, um, which was 86%. And typically during this period of time, we're talking about a week to 10 days, the average is somewhere around 60, maybe 40%. So this was a really high amount, and essentially was just another summer chump pulse that occurred during the fall season. So as a result of this, we had to revise our preseason projection for fall chum, taking into account this large pulse of summer chum that occurred right at the beginning of the season. And that's exactly what we did. And what that did is it adjusted our preseason projection from what I just mentioned previously to 700 to 800,000 fish. With this level of escapement or this level of a run size, it was expected to be enough for escapement, for subsistence, and for personal use, and also with a limited amount for commercial fisheries. And I should say, and I mentioned it, that it's this preseason projection that we base our initial management on. I will mention this is that regardless of the projection, um, and this projection was revised on August 3rd, but re re regardless of the projection, whether it was the first one or the second one, we didn't anticipate that there would be any effect on the manage of our subsistence fisheries. In other words, regardless of the, the first projection or the second one, we felt that it would not have an impact on the way we managed, but it did have a definite effect on the way that we managed our commercial fisheries. And I'll mention a little bit more about that in just a moment. <clears throat> so 
So as the fall chum salmon run progresses during the season, we start kind of switching from basing our management on that preseason projection to basing our management more on information that we're getting from in-season assessment projects. And those projects include test fisheries in the lower river, um, counts from the main stem sonar near pilot station, and then also from information we get from commercial and subsistence harvests. And typically, not always, and this varies between years depending on you know, run timing and whatnot, we typically start switching from management based on the preseason projection to in season right around the end of July, maybe the first part of August. So just you know, for folks that are not familiar, I'd like to just kind of point out where some of these in season projects are, assessment projects are in the Laura River and also kind of the information that they give us. So just to kind of orient you a little bit, this is the Lower Yukon River, this is the mouth, this is the south mouth, middle mouth, north mouth, the community of Amonic, Mountain Village, St. Mary's, and Pilot Station. So a test fishery is operated in both the middle and south mouths, and these are operated in cooperation with the YDFDA and provides us with run timing and relative abundances. It doesn't tell us how many fish are there, but it does tell us that there was more fish there than there was yesterday, and it also kind of tells us how long this group of fish coming in are. Pulses. We operate a second test fishery near the community of Mountain Village, and this kind of serves, this is in cooperation with the Mountain Village Tribal Council, and this kind of provides us with a confirmation of what we were seeing in the Lower Yukon test fishery. And then finally, we have the main stem sonar, which is operated near the community of Pilot Station. And this is this project that gives us our first abundance estimate of the fall chum that are coming in the river. And it's about starting here, it's about two days to here, and then an additional day here. So from the Lower Yukon Test Fisheries to Pilot Station, it's about three days of travel time for fish, and that varies greatly between uh, water level and so forth. So. I also want to mention, too, that Pilot Station, the sonar there near Pilot Station also provides a platform for us to be able to collect genetic information, which is what we do when we do our genetic stock or mixed stock analysis that you've heard being talked about quite a bit. And together with harvest information and input from the fishermen, the information from these projects collectively inform the management decisions that we make in season. So how did we do? How did the run look like? Not necessarily how we do, but how did the run look like? So we're gonna take a look. So this is similar to what I showed a little bit. These blue bars represent daily passage of, of chum salmon at Pilot Station, at the sonar near Pilot Station on each day it's from 19 July through the 30th of August. And this black line represents the level of fish or the projection of fall chum that we need to have to be at 550,000 fish. And that's kind of an important number for us because that, by regulation, is the threshold that we need to be at to allow commercial fishing. In other words, we have to have a run projection of 550,000 fish or greater to allow commercial fishing. So next what I'm gonna do is add a cumulative passage line. So what this line right here is showing is basically adding up all of these together and showing the passage. This is the cumulative passage through roughly the 3rd of August. So as you look at this right now, you say to yourself, well, the run's looking pretty good so far. We're definitely above the 550, and we've got a surplus for commercial. And if you recall, I mentioned that the, the difference in the preseason projection impacted our management of the fisheries. And what we had to do is we had to account for that large number of summer chum that came in with that first pulse when we were doing our in-season management, and we did that. So essentially we had to drop our cumulative passage line to account for that large number of summer chum that came in with that first pulse to actually get an idea of how many fall chum we had to help us in guiding our management. When we, when we knew that large amount of summer chum was there, and we kind of looked at just the fall chum total, it looks a little bit different at the beginning of the season, and that certainly guided our management. 
As the second pulse came in, you know, things were looking a little bit better for the fall chum, which was to be expected. And then the subsequent pulses, things went pretty well. We had a surplus, we were above the 550 line, subsistence fishing was unrestricted, um, things were going good. So what I want to do now is shift gears and review the fall season management for 2019, kind of what we were looking at. And by the way, just so you know, Fred and Gerald were on the phone by teleconference when we were meeting in the Fairbanks office having our management meeting. Just want to make sure to point that out. So for the subsistence management, as I mentioned earlier, uh, really not any impact on when we changed our preseason projection that we expected. And what happened was that all districts and subdistricts went to their full restrict or full schedule, unrestricted fisheries, and then shortly afterwards went to seven days a week. 24 hours a day. The one, one exception, of course, was the Porcupine River, and I will be covering that here in just a little bit. We did close that fishery on the 23rd. Um, and the way it works is with the fall season is that we follow the migration of the fall chum run upriver, and as it gets to the next district or sub-district, that's when they switch over to fall season management. So this is the map of the Yukon area for the U.S. side, and this is just showing the average subsistence harvest in each area of the river from 2014 to 2018. And this is just so you can get an idea for the folks that are not real familiar with where and how many fall chum are harvested and coho as well along the river. Lower River Districts 1, 2, and 3. You can see what the averages are, Middle River, and then also in the upper river where the majority of the fall season, uh, fall chum harvest occurs for subsistence. And then of course a little bit in District 6, which is the Tanana River. So as we uh, kind of, um, you know, as we, we found out with the summer season as well as that right now we're still in the process of getting our subsistence harvest estimates. It's a process that takes a little bit of time. We're still in the process of getting permits back and so forth. We don't really have an estimate to give yet. But we, are, we do expect that the fall chum harvest on the U.S. side for subsistence will be maybe similar to what we saw in 2018, maybe a little bit lower, but definitely well below the most recent five-year averages, average. And that's what these black lines right there are. And really, you know, what I've been talking with people on the river and getting feedback from, him, from folks is that it really wasn't an issue because there wasn't enough fish or enough opportunity uh, subsistence fishermen this year were able to get um, some kings, which helped out, and they had less needs or less uh, need for fall chum. They had other activities that took a priority in the fall time, gathering wood, getting berries, so forth and such. And then also, I think another thing too is that we've heard that you know fall chum, especially in the later part, is is really used uh, for for dog food for dog teams. And we've heard that there's a, a few of the people on the river that were really big you know, runners of dogs and had big dog teams are no longer doing it and kind of making a big difference in the harvest. <clears throat> so now I'm going to move on to commercial management. Uh, just touch on this real briefly. You know, as I mentioned, we had to take a very cautious, you know, the, the, the projection, the change in the projection we made changed our approach to the commercial fishery. At the beginning of the season through the first of, or third of August, we had that very low projection and we had to be very cautious in, in how we managed our commercial fishery we were. Um, we actually had very few commercial periods during that time, and if we did have commercial periods, they were very short in duration. But, and I, going back to that graph, when you saw the, where the run started picking up, that as the season progressed, we got a little bit more comfortable with our in-season projection, and we increased the amount of commercial fishing. And again, this is just for information for folks that are not familiar. Um, this is where commercial fishing occurs in the district or in the Yukon area on the U.S. side for uh, fall chum. Districts one and two where the majority of the harvest of both fall chum and coho occurs. We have a very small scale fishery that occurs in district, subdistricts 5, B, and C. This is the bridge area. And then, of course, we have commercial fishing that occurs in district six. Uh, the majority of this fishing right here is actually uh, for subsistence needs. It's 
the commercial fishermen going out and doing the work for the subsistence fishermen. Um, and what we're seeing is more commercial harvest, but a little bit less subsistence because they're kind of trading off on who's doing the work. And then this is the commercial harvest for 2019. And you can see that uh, the, the harvest this year was 268,000 roughly. Um, and this is the lower, this is well below the, or not well below, but below the most recent five year average um, for 2019. So now I'm going to take a look at now at assessment. This is postseason assessment. Look at escapement, how we did, and kind of report out some information. There's four major spawning areas of fall chum in the Yukon area: the Tidrindrick River, Porcupine River, and in the main stem Canada, and into the Tanana River drainage. This table right here just kind of shows the preliminary estimates for each one of the places where we have a goal or objective and then how we did, and the colors are not what they're supposed to be, but um, the gray, I think it looks like, is exceeded, the green is within, and then the fishing branch, of course, in the, I guess, orange, did not meet a treaty objective. So these next two slides that I'm gonna show are just kind of reporting out information of the uh, run characteristics of fall chum for 2019. This chart depicts the percentage of summer chum and fall chum salmon stocks that were coming in on July, after July 19th. Overall, the summer chum composition of 35% uh, was a record. It actually beat the previous record of 25% that we saw in 2010. And then if you take the fall, if you take the fall components or the fall part and break it down into the different components for the fall season, um, that's what you see right there, and just to mention for a point that the Tanana River stocks this year were above average. And just pointing out age composition, looking at the age composition, percent female and length, um, just the one thing of note here, we had an above average showing of four-year-olds, a below average showing of five-year-olds, Slightly below average number of females, and they were smaller fish this year, which is the reports that we were getting from folks on the river. And then I, what I like to do at the end of the presentation is just kind of give you an overall, putting it all together, look, how are fall chum doing overall? And what, what this graph is showing is from 20, uh, 1999 through 2019, the blue portion represents the overall drainage escapement. This is the overall, all the tributaries and whatnot. And then the lighter blue represents the harvest that occurred in each year. This is a combination of Canadian, U.S. subsistence, and commercial personal use. And then the two lines going across represent the drainage-wide SEG goal of 300,000 to 600,000 fish. In a nutshell, fall chum have mostly met or exceeded the drainage wide escapement goal since uh, 2001, or since 1999. There's been harvests allowed in each of those years. And again, with the exception being the porcupine, which we will cover in, in my next presentation. So it, it appears right now that the fall chum are healthy and the stock's doing well, providing some harvest, making our escapement goals. <clears throat> And then before I move on or close, I'm just gonna talk real quickly about coho salmon. Uh, 2019 run size index was below average at 169,000. Typical average run size is 217,000. The run was approximately five days late this year. We do have one escapement goal for coho salmon in the Yukon River drainage at the Delta Clearwater River, which is a tributary of the Tanana, and that goal was not met this year. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge all of the different entities that we work with cooperatively to make the fall season happen. Um, each one of these folks provide uh, help, support to us in, in getting our job done. And a big shout out and thank you to each one of them. So, and with that, I'll, I guess we're going to go right into the fishing branch, right? Okay. May pause for questions here. It may be a good. Uh... Break point. So, for panel members, uh, any questions on the 
U.S. Uh, fall chum salmon presentation. Oh, uh, Dennis Zimmerman, go ahead. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I'm just trying to get a sense of kind of the bigger, longer-term patterns, perhaps. So if you go to 20, right? Slide 20? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, there's... I guess I'm thinking of it in terms of multiple species. I know your job is fall chum, and I get that. But it strikes me that, you know, when we look at something annually on a yearly basis, and then we look at an individual species in isolation, you know, things may make sense. But I guess I'm concerned because we, you know, we've been struggling with Chinook, and we've had, we've been lucky because we've been offsetting a lot of those, the harvest. People have been meeting needs by taking other species, right? Um, I guess, is there anybody looking at the bigger picture here? Like, we've got, you know, the bigger patterns, right, in terms of, I mean, we've already, I won't get into climate change, all that stuff, but, you know, we ha we've had healthy runs of Chinook for the last, you know, 20-odd years, or sorry, a fall chum. We've had poor runs of Chinook, and so we've been lucky because people have been meeting their needs and commercial interests, et cetera, on the Alaskan side. Um, and yet I'm seeing, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit worried about that stock, right? It, you know, it, there's no guarantees those stocks are going to get, are going to stay at that range. So I feel like we need to be planning for, with a precautionary principle for the future. And I'm just not sure, is there any mechanism in Alaska to look at the longer term, bigger picture? And I mean, you also have multiple other stocks, right? You've got sockeye, you've got pinks, you've got other things. So are we kind of looking at the relative, I understand the laws in Alaska are set up to meet subsistence needs and things of that nature. So is anyone looking at the bigger picture? And does that factor into, how does that factor into our management models? I realize it's an abstract question, but is there anything you can share with me there? <clears throat> well, yeah, um, I'm not sure how far in the future we can look. You know, I mean, we're, we're always concerned and looking to try to, and maybe Bonnie can out when I'm done here, but, um, you know, is there any indication such as maybe productivity or whatever that indicates it might be going? As a matter of fact, we were just discussing this maybe a year ago about looking ahead at productivity and seeing, you know, is it dropping a little bit? Is that going to be something we need to be concerned about? Um, you know, so looking ahead as far as we can, we do that. Um, also, I would say, too, is just, you know, every year coming into management, we take a very conservative approach to begin with to make sure that we don't get caught off guard, so to speak, with a run that doesn't come back. Um, but, you know, as far as the big picture, I mean, I understand the importance of fall chum, particularly in trying times we have with, with the Chinook and how they played. And I understand that, you know, if they were to crash as well, that would be bad. Um, so I don't know how much we can do, but it is something that we look at and we're always kind of making sure that we're looking for things that can give us some sort of indication. Right, and it, it, I guess a further comment, it, I mean, it strikes me as it's probably more of a, man it's a management question, right? Um, you know, if, we, if we're thinking, you know, in particular with fall chum, there's a treaty, you know, we're gonna get, we talked about, you didn't meet, we didn't meet escapement on fishing branch again. Um, you know, it's in a really bad spot, that one particular stock. And it seems to me that if we, it, one, one mechanism by which we could meet fishing branch is by probably being more restrictive on fall chum generally across, but recognizing you need to provide, you need to meet needs in terms of opportunity, maybe harvest other fish that aren't part of this treaty. So I just think like that's kind of that bigger, bigger picture management question in order to meet treaty obligations with Canada is perhaps offset harvest with other fish. I mean, I, I realize we're kind of, you know, there's different factors at play, but that, you know, because I mean, I've been hearing for many years now, we don't have the tools, it's very difficult with a mixed stock to, to isolate the fishing branch fish, I get that, but it seems like maybe it's a bigger picture management question. Anyways, it's more of a, more of a statement at this point. Thank you. Question from panel member Ragnar Alstrom. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Estenson, on this slide, there seems to be an odd pattern. Maybe you could try your best to answer it. It seems like in years like 20, 2005 and 2017, you've had large escapement followed by returns from that escapement four or five years later of some of the worst returns. Do you have any idea why that's happening? Um, don't know why it's, um, except when you do get a lot of fish on the spawning grounds, um, they can superposition each other and ruin, um, other 
some reds that are already in there when you get that many fish and then when they all the juveniles go out it it can be that it could be um just other um effects in the ocean with all that many juveniles because you're including the summer chum sometimes we get four million of them on a, on a year we get good fall chum and you've got all of those fish going out to the ocean and they co they compete with um, pink salmon and all the fry that go out so that can have an effect and we are watching the pinks part of his other question um, pinks have been increasing in the last few years we will be watching um, their effect we're even getting some some bigger runs even on odd number years even though on they're typically even numbered year fish. But uh, pink salmon don't go as far up river as um, fall chum salmon. So the part that he asked about harvest of other species, the pink salmon are earlier and don't um, go much above the Ambic River. But as far as fall chum, we have seen this cycle of, of large runs with, with poor production. And we're just going to continue to watch that. And a lot of times you'll see it when we do the preseason projection with the Ricker model will will show that that um, it, it, it's going to anticipate that to happen when we do get a big run. So we will take that into account when we do our the preseason. And I believe we show you a chart of that the future looking based on the Ricker, and it will show um, a downturn after a, a large run like that. Um. Oh, okay. I was going to ask a question, but go ahead, uh, panel member Andy Bassage. Thank you. I, I'm not sure this is, maybe it's a question, um, and it's for Jeff. Um, given the, um, the relationship between summer chum and fall chum in your, your um, setting up your management uh, actions early on, estimating, and given the fact that we potentially lost a fairly large spawning area in the Kalani Lakes area due to that, that glacier that shifted and water lit, uh, table dropped. And I'm wondering how, uh, if you could maybe inform us a little bit about how you're going to factor that into your projections and your management, potential management actions, uh, given the fact that you may lose that relationship between summer chum and fall chum due to a a drop in productivity of the fall chum. No, good question. <clears throat> Excuse me, good question, Andy, and I appreciate you asking that. And yes, um, we are well aware. And this year, that that occurred in 2016. We actually saw a little bit of that. We would have seen a little bit of that with the three-year-olds, but the three-year-olds make up such a small percentage of the run. Next year, it'll be impacting the four-year-olds, which I don't need to tell folks. Uh, are kind of the meat and potatoes of a fall chum run, roughly 74%. So, um, and you're right, because that necessarily won't come out. You know, we kind of talk about how we can get an idea from that summer to fall relationship in comparison if it's run's not going to come in as expected, but that wouldn't necessarily show up in the summer to fall relationship. Um, we are going to be aware of it. I, I think that it'll be in our management minds as we enter the season and when we're looking at things like that and making our contingency plans. I, I think that, you know, the first way we would be able to look at that or see that, you know, when we're looking at the genetic composition of what's coming in, we would be able to maybe see that something is not right with the Canadian component that we would expect to see. Um, and that might be a first indication that we might have issues. Um, and at what point we or how we would adjust our management really just depends on where we're at in season. I can't necessarily speak to that right now. But I do want to make it that, that we do have some sort of mechanisms in place to be able to at least try to identify, hopefully, if that is going to be an issue. Um, and it's also just very clear that it's not something that's going to take us by surprise. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, uh, your genetic markers are going to show the difference between Chandelar fishing branch and main stem, correct? Yes. And do you have, is there a basic or normalized run timing for those upper Yukon main stem stocks in the run, Bonnie? That's probably more for you. So I'm just curious if there, over over time, is there a particular time in the run where you tend to see more of the genetic samples of the upper Yukon uh, fall chum? 
I don't know if you've seen the uh, genetic slides that we put out every year on your, uh, in the um, packets that we send out every day. The Chandelar border, U.S. border stocks, which includes Chandelar, Black River, and Sheen Jack area, they come, typically come in slightly before the Canadian main stem. Um, it's real slight. It can look the other way in some years. It was, this year it was higher Canadian main stem, supposedly, than Chandelar, Sheen Jack, but that's not what actually ended up. The, the Canadian main stem ended up in its normal timing, and for even the genetics, everything was on track as normal as you saw in the chart we showed the other day with the, where, where those three pulses ended up at Eagle, and that's, that's typical for Eagle um, area. So I don't know if we'd be able to, um, I will, I'll look at, uh, I think Kluani is part of the White River system, and we do get some genetics on white. I'd have to look and see what the confidence bounds around those are, and um, look at uh, where they come in in the run, and it, it's, most likely they're within all of those stocks. I mean, they're gonna be the similar timing to what goes to the main stem as far as for our management. So I don't think we'll be able to tease them out as a certain part of the run that we would be able to um, target just, just to look at the white itself. Okay, so uh, I'd like to ask one question if I may. Uh, First off, thank you very much for the information provided in the presentation. There's certainly a lot here and um, obviously indicative of the tremendous amount of work and effort that goes into uh, interpreting, analyzing, and making decisions with respect to uh, managing fisheries. Um, I will admit, though, I find that at times I'm struggling and almost like I'll use the perennial analogy where Canadians, when we cross the border into the U.S., we have to convert temperature into Fahrenheit, and likewise, our uh, American neighbors come and visit uh, Canada, and uh, they need to convert temperature into Celsius. Um, and so, with that in mind, I, I look at the information that's presented in in this uh, in this uh, presentation, and uh, it strikes me that it's almost exclusively speaking to U.S. basically mixed stocks. Um, so the numbers that are being reported when we refer to 1.2 million or 800,000, um, that's a combination of Canadian origin stocks and, and U.S. origin stocks. And so understanding that the, the, the purpose and the function of this process and, and the treaty which established this, this process is exclusively focused on Canadian origin salmon and management to uh, achieve uh, treaty objectives for Canadian origin salmon stocks. Is there some way that this information could be presented to perhaps better illustrate that? And, you know, from my perspective, looking through the information, um, kind of the, the key to interpreting everything is, is on one of the last slides, which speaks to uh, the genetic composition. So perhaps, um, it's not so much a question, maybe, but perhaps a recommendation for the future. If for this audience, um, the presentation could be tailored to uh, more clearly convey the, the relevant components, at least the components that are relevant to this panel process, which is the Canadian origin stocks. Uh, because I can, I can assure you that uh, if I'm struggling interpreting some of the information, that others are probably likely as well. And it's difficult to somehow reconcile, you know, what does 1.2 million chum salmon actually mean as far as Canadian stocks go? So anyway, perhaps just an observation. Sure, and thank you for that, Mr. Co-Chair. And I really appreciate that. And I think when, since I've been doing this, there was some sort of, when I came on board, there was like, well, the Canadian, you know, when we go through Jesse's, they would report that. And I asked the same question while we don't, but I think that we can probably start incorporating that. And I appreciate that. And we'll look at doing that. So thank you. Okay, so uh, would you like to continue into the, the porcupine presentation, I guess, or? Yes, it's a yeah, separate okay, one. I thank you. Up real quick. Okay, so let's, uh, what I'm gonna do now is kind of summarize a little bit about uh, what the U.S. Uh, management was for the uh, U.S. portion of the porcupine with an attempt to try to get uh, more fish to the Canadian portion of the porcupine. As many of you know that it's been a chronic, or there's been a chronic inability to meet the, the 
Porcupine or the fishing branch IMEG for a number of years now. Um, and I just want to summarize the action that the U.S. has taken to try to get more fish up there to meet that. But then I also want to talk a little bit about some of the other things that we've looked at um, to try to increase that number and then kind of give some food for thought to end my presentation. So to get started, this year as we entered the season, we based, we, we kind of think ahead a little bit about what we might have to do to uh, to, um, for action in the U.S. portion of the Porcupine River. And we base that a little bit, or our first thoughts are based on our preseason pre projection. In this case, the modified one, the adjustment we made. And going in, we knew it was going to be 700, 800,000 fish. What we've seen over the years that, that run sizes overall for the drainage, less than a million fish. Typically, we do not meet the IMEG um, at the Fishing Branch River Weir for fall chum. And as, a, as it turns out, what we did is we did close subsistence fishing in the U.S. portion of the main stem porcupine uh, on August 23rd. And that's subsistence salmon fishing. <clears throat> as the season progressed, we did monitor uh, with very good cooperation with DFO on getting this information to us. Um, we did manage salmon passage counts and also weir counts at the sonar near Old Crow and at the Fishing Branch River Weir. And assessment, as the season was going on, assessment gave us a really good indication that the IMEG at the Fishing Branch River Weir was not going to be achieved. And as a result of that, we did continue to have subsistence fishing for salmon clothes for the entire season. And this is the U.S. portion of the porcupine. For those of you that are not familiar or are not aware of what we do on the U.S. side, I just want to kind of give you a real quick map orientation. This is the Yukon River right here, Fort Yukon. This is the main stem Porcupine River all the way up to the Canadian-Alaska border. And what we did is we had the whole main stem closed to subsistence salmon fishing. Uh, as a standard practice on, on the U.S. side, even when subsistence salmon fishing is closed, fishermen can continue to use four-inch mesh or less to fish for non-salmon species. And I also want to point out that the tributaries remained open for subsistence fishing for salmon. Now, if anybody has been to the confluence of the Porcupine River and the Yukon, they know that it's not a cut-and-dried confluence. It's pretty nebulous. It's very braided. Um, and... We ended up having to come up with a way or how what we were going to close at the confluence and with a very good meeting with the residents of Fort Yukon um, that were very supportive in trying to get more fish up to Old Crow. Um, in a meeting with these folks, we were able to kind of map out where and where what should be closed in that confluence, and this is what we ended up with. So I just want to touch briefly on the, current, the basis for our current management. Why are we doing what we're doing right now? Um, as many of you know, the fishing branch stocks make up a very small portion of the overall Yukon River fall chum run. It's about 4% of the run. So. And it's likely that when you go from the, when you're looking at all the fall chum that are in the Yukon River from the mouth all the way up to the confluence with the porcupine, that is the proportion you're seeing in there. While the chum salmon that are there, um, most of them are fall, or most of them are not fall, or a very small percentage of them are fishing branch stocks. So when you start entering into the Porcupine River, and this is from the confluence down to the Sheenjack, um, you're seeing the number of, of porcupine or fishing branch fall chum stocks increasing, but there's still a lot of other stocks such as the Sheenjack that are also present. It's so when you get above the sheen jack and up to the border is when you can be assured that the fish that you're conserving through your conservation efforts are mostly or are focused on fishing branch river stocks. <coughs> so we've been closing or restricting subsistence salmon fishing on the porcupine now for five years in an attempt to try to get more fish up there. Um, and what we're focusing it on here is that it gives us the most it allows us to focus our conservation effort on where we know we're going to be saving the most fishing branch fish. And that's why we're taking the actions that we're taking right now. I do want to point out to everybody, though, that we're always looking for additional information. 
you know, we're always looking for other ways and means of being able to get more fish to the, to the Fishing Branch River. Um, and, and hopefully kind of informing us or giving us d additional measures that we could take in terms of conservation to do this. You know, the department and myself are really committed in making, you know, being part of the process that we can do to try to solve this, this problem with the porcupine. Um, and and this, this effort to do this is kind of ongoing on my staff with Fred as well, and it's something that we're always looking at. But the real, you know, the real issue is uh, with management is, is basically being able to pinpoint when fishing branch fall chump stocks are coming into the river. Where, where are they? When are they coming in? And that is a really a, a big issue and kind of hinders us a little bit. You know, with Chandelar stocks, with Mainstem Canada, with Tanana stocks, we are able to tell which pulses are coming in, you know, over time. And, and if we had to do something, we could. Completely, totally the opposite with the, fish, with the uh, Fishing Branch River fall chum. And what this is preventing us to, uh, doing is taking more of a focused management action to try to get more fish to the. So I just want to show you a couple of things that we've done or we looked at just to kind of, so that to inform folks, and I presented this to the panel a number of years ago, but it's good to revisit this, uh, especially for the new folks that are here. One of them was looking at using genetic information uh, to try to isolate or determine what parts of the run overall run the fall chum are coming in. What we're seeing in these two graphs is just the, for the whole entire season, the genetic, you know, contribution to fall chum from the Fishing Branch River. And these are the years right here. Each one of these light colored bars is, is the genetic estimate with the error about that. And then just for comparison, this is the same thing that we uh, do for uh, fall chum that cross the border near Eagle. And I just want to point out that these are from samples that are collected at the, the sonar near Pilot Station, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is the one that provides the genetic analysis. So <clears throat> fishing branch stocks, again, as I mentioned, are a very small portion of the overall fall chum run. And as such, it's not so much that they're not genetically distinct because fall chum from the fishing branch are genetically distinct, but because they're such a small portion when you do a genetic analysis, a lot of times when it comes back, you see error bars that are below zero, which pretty much means it doesn't tell us anything. And as it stands right now, because of the number of samples we have to collect, the small proportion of fishing branch stocks that are present, uh, that the accuracy and precision of these genetic um, analysis is, is not there for us to be able to use it for anything, unfortunately. Um, and then also I want to point out too that this would be more long term where we'd be able to over time see that, you know, through genetic analysis that maybe the fishing branch stocks are in the second pulse or in the first pulse or the third pulse. But really, as it stands with all genetics, the being able to use the information in season uh, might not be there as well because, you know, we have to collect the samples, they have to go to Anchorage, they have to be analyzed. And it takes a little bit of time, and by that time, the fish might be gone. <clears throat> so another... Stopped working. Can't advance the slide, sorry. I tried doing that. Technology. Remember slideshows when you had a little carousel and you Okay, that would be just pass it right there. Okay, sorry about that. So another thing that we looked at was trying to another way we tried to go about trying to determine timing of the fishing branch stocks coming in was by looking at pilot station passage of fall chum compared to um, fall chum passage at the fishing branch river weir. And what these graphs are showing you here 
and this is for 2018, this is for 29, the red or the blue diamonds represents passage, daily passage at pilot station sonar from the 19th through the 7th, and then the red represents passage, daily passage at the Fishing Branch River Weir. And what we've done is we've taken the Fishing Branch Passage and backed it up 30 days because that is the travel time be between the sonar and the weir. And we're looking for any kind of evidence that would suggest that the portion of the, fall, the Fishing Branch stocks come in on any portion of the run. So you might expect to see the red, if they came in on the early part, you might see the red part bumping up a little bit before with the passage of the sonar. But what this is kind of showing us is that they're pretty much right on top of each other. And it looks like, from what we've been able to tell, is that the Fishing Branch River stocks come in all throughout the entire run. Uh, one question, one thing I want to point out is that we didn't cherry pick these. This is not, these, this is really showing our point. Bonnie has gone through over the years that we have this data to really look at this. And the reason why we're showing these two slides is because they do the best job of really showing what we've seen overall as far as patterns are concerned. The second one here is we were looking at, is there, in, is there any one particular pulse that the fishing branch stocks might be coming in? So for example, the first pulse, second pulse, third pulse. And what this is kind of showing us here is they're kind of coming in with each one of the pulses and they're kind of staying up there a little bit just because once they start getting up river, they kind of just start, they don't necessarily stay in a little nice tight pack, they kind of spread out a little bit. So what we're looking at this is that what we find out from looking at this and doing this analysis that there just wasn't really any portion that we could tell looking at all the years where the fishing branch stocks are coming in. So just to kind of reiterate, you know, trying to pinpoint you know, where they're coming in, which would allow us to take a little bit more of a focused management action. It's just the information is just not there for us. So some other things that I wanted to just kind of point out from my perspective and uh, just some thoughts for folks to think about about this whole situation and problem is that um, there's a lot of uncertainty around what's going on and, and what's going on with the fishing branch fall chum stocks. Uh, my travels to Old Crow, my travels to different parts of the river, um, there's one of the questions I always get asked are why are the fishing branch stocks doing so poorly compared to the rest of the Yukon River drainage? The Chandelier is doing well, Main Stem is doing well, Tanana is doing well. I've also had the very, uh, I had the honor of, of going to Old Crow twice to be able to talk to the residents and the fishermen of those community, of that community. Um, and both of those trips were above and beyond productive for me and very educational. And what I hear from the, from the residents of, the, of that community is that there's a lot changing in their landscape. You know, they're seeing, they're seeing uh, lakes disappear, you know, in case, some case overnight or during the course of a day. Um, they're talking about rivers that were used to be clear that have gone turbid. Um, they're talking about, you know, areas that are now going subsurface. And, and this is nothing new. I think we all know this. Um, but it just, it, it just makes you kind of wonder, ask the question, too, is how is this impacting the productivity of fishing branch fall chum stocks? And I just wanted this next slide right here. This changing productivity of, of especially for chum salmon, is nothing new. We've seen it in the Yukon area. Uh, the classic is the Anvik River summer chum. What this graph is showing is from the years 95 through 13, the blue portion is the, uh, what the Anvik or the portion that the Anvik sonar counted compared to the rest of the drainage at the main stem sonar. And just uh, to, to take home here is that previously or prior to 2003, the average proportion of Anvik River to the overall summer chum was about 50%. And there was a shift that occurred in 23 to where that dropped to about 20%. We've also seen shifts in productivity with fall chum in the Toklat River, which has been attributed to the earthquake that happened in 25, I think it was, right, or so, um, where a lot of underground seismic activity occurred. 
And just a question to ask, is this something similar maybe what we're seeing with Porcupine River Fall Chum, with the landscape changes that we are hearing about? And just kind of remind folks, you know, it changes that can affect levels of production, temperature, obviously with air and water temperature it can affect migration. So we heard survive, or mortality, um, incubation periods, changes to surface and subsurface flows. You know, groundwater chemistry can affect the, you know, the chemistry of the water. The groundwater or the ground chemistry can affect the, the chemistry of the groundwater. We all know the fall chum are very selective in where they spawn with the upwelling. Um, and they could have effects on that. Um, drying up of water bodies, loss of permafrost, and snow depth. But the last thing I want to end on is, is potential research and things that, you know, we've talked about that can really help us maybe understand this problem a little bit better and even aid in, you know, improving our management. Um, studies to determine the cause of the decline in production. You know, ongoing studies for potential enhancement, for us improving the genetic analysis to identify the fishing branch stocks in season, um, somehow being able to be able to detect these with more accuracy and precision. Um, determine U.S. harvest proportions to develop production models. This would really go a long ways for us to, to really take a look at productivity and to see if it is indeed changing and by how much. Um, and the one component that's really missing from that is a really good harvest estimate um, and then the last one I have there is other, and this is really, you know, uh, again, I kind of mentioned this earlier, is that I think that from the department, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we're very committed to trying to do what we can to try to get to the root of this problem so that we can do something about it. And, I mean, I can speak to, for myself and, and Bonnie that we would be willing to, you know, look at stuff and do what we can to try to help that out um, in whatever research can be done. Um, we're for it. We're 100% behind it. Um, and um, that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Estenson. Uh, so questions from panel members uh, on the U.S. Uh, fall chum salmon presentation for the porcupine. Go ahead, uh, panel member Dennis Zimmerman and then uh, Alvon Finster. Paul. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Al, did you have comments as well? You go first. <laughs> oh, it's on. Good. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jeff. That was very interesting. Um, the my understanding of the fishing branch issue, that is the lack of escapement, is that. Uh, the stock is a small stock, and it's distributed uh, along the entire U.S. run, or it's considered to be distributed across the entire U.S. Uh, run. But, um, and as a result of that, unless the fisheries are really reduced in Alaska, the fishing branch escapement will not rise to the level that was agreed upon in the treaty. That's a 50 to 100,000. Is that more or less correct, or? Well, to some extent, I would say maybe. Um, you know, as I've tried to get across here, you know, we don't know where, you know, where they're coming in and to what extent they're coming in, what portion of the run. You know, if we knew that and we could take a focused action, we would potentially be able to do something that could increase that number beyond what we're doing already. Um, but, you know, the problem for us is, you know, we could just say we could not harvest and it'll be good, but it's more of how can we focus the harvest effort to not, to really focus on getting, making sure we're getting fishing branch stock fall chum as opposed to just maybe, you know, having unfocused conservation efforts. Okay, so right now we're about <clears throat> just under 20 years into the treaty itself and, and the issue persists. Um, certain people in Oak Row are, are quite, well, a lot of the people in Oak Row are quite upset that they're not seeing, and they're see, not seeing an effect from that. Uh, the community has taken some research uh, on up at Fishing Branch, and as, they, as far as they've seen, for the most part, the um, habitat is intact. 
there is a, a certain amount of area that does become wa dewatered, et cetera. But even if they were to, say, remove all those fish from there and then take them downstream to allow them to spawn, it still wouldn't make up for the, the uh, 20 or 30,000 fish a year that they are missing from that. I guess that I don't think it would be fair to close off the fisheries in Alaska for that. But I think that given that there has been in the treaty a commitment to make that escapement, that there, it is up to the parties, Canada and the United States, to make up for that in the interim of the period when the escapement isn't achieved. Uh, given the fact that we've been 20 years and we're still, we don't seem to be much closer to it. And your, your efforts are appreciated in closing off the mouths of porcupine. The people of Oak Crow are really um, uh, favorable to you and your efforts, but the fish just aren't there. And if the fish just aren't there and if there's no resolution in sight for that, then the next step has to be taken, whatever those, that step is done. And I don't want to get any further into that, but if, if it isn't succeeding, something else has to be done about it. Thank you. Uh, panel member Dennis Simmerman and then Rhonda Pitka. Sure, thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, and I wanted to also echo a lot of what Al said. I mean, acknowledge your efforts. I, I was fortunate to be working um, in Old Crow with Al and Darius and uh, Jeff and Caroline and a number of other people over the years. Um, and I guess this, this strikes me. I think we have a real opportunity in front of us with this. Um, I don't believe, I mean, I made the point yesterday about chasing data and there's never, there's never enough data. And I think in 10 years we'll be looking at data. And this is a very complex mixed stock fishery. Um, but this strikes me as a real opportunity for the panel to, I guess, acknowledge or say, you know, we don't, we don't always have the answers and it's okay to ask for help. And I think given the nature of that river with Fort Yukon and with Old Crow, you know, we've got James Kelly here, we've got Darius Elias, we've got Stan and Julie Sr. Um, you know, a part of their planning has been working with their sort of brothers and sisters, uh, Gwich'in people. And I think this might be an opportunity for us to really look at their, give them the control of that fishery and basically put it in their hands and say, okay, we don't have the answers. We've got a lot of good science here. And guys like Jeff, I know you will, you will appreciate these efforts and be a part of that. And I know on the Canadian side as well, but this might be a real opportunity to put in traditional knowledge, not even put in traditional knowledge, really truly meaningfully guide this by traditional knowledge, as well as traditional forms of governance. Um, you know, they've been working together. They have, they have means and, and ways that they work together as two communities, as Gwich'in people, to manage their resources. They've done it with caribou. They've done it with a lot of other uh, foods. And they've been very successful doing it internationally. So maybe we should basically let them lead this process. And I would love to, as a panel member, see a project by the Gwich'in, Fort Yukon, uh, old, you know, Wunta Gwich'in, whoever drives it, agency. Um, you know, maybe it's another organization. Uh, a project where they essentially come up with a, with a way that they anticipate governing this tree. Because we're putting the burden on Fort Yukon. I mean, let's call a spade a spade. You know, this is an, yesterday we heard the example of staring at the fire and not looking at the stars. Um, you know, we're staring at the fire on this one and trying to manage a mixed stock as it's passing by all these communities and then we end up, um, you know, putting that pressure on Fort Yukon and Old Crow. So I guess I'd like to, as a panel member, I'd love to see a project that really looks at traditional knowledge, traditional governance, and puts them in control and the agencies and the panel support them. Panel member Rhonda Pitka, go ahead. Uh, my comment is somewhat similar, but I do have a question about where the fishing branch weir is located and where the sonar is located on Porcupine River. And does the location of those particular counting um, projects have any impact on what those numbers are and what's the con confidence interval? So I think we should probably look to the next presentation yeah, yeah, yeah. for because we will receive some detailed information about the project itself but for the presenters that will be providing that take note uh, please address uh, panel member Rhonda Pitka's question other questions from panel members panel member Ragnar Alstrom go ahead Mr. Chairman um, 
Mr. Estenson, you uh, referenced uh, changes in production. You referenced the Toklak River fault sum. Um, Toklak River, if I r remember correctly, in the 90s had a similar production problem, a return problem. And in fact, uh, on the U.S. side, there was uh, management schemes put in place to address that problem. After a number of years, those uh, management schemes were, were pulled. And in my mind, uh, no matter which included commercial fishing closures to try to get the toklat, sto toklat stock into the toklat uh, at very small percentages as in the fishing branch, would you characterize the, the, the management schemes, scheme that was developed and then pulled as a failure? Um, we used a similar to what we're doing with Fishing Branch. We restricted the Kantishna, which the Toklat flowed into, 6A of the Tanana River, which was below the Kantishna, and including 5A, which is where the Yukon, the fish bank orientate, into at the village of Tanana. All of those were restricted for uh, commercial and sometimes subsistence to meet that. Um, those were, you know, helping get more fish to the Toklat to some extent. Um, after that, um, the runs started coming back. That was, I think that um, they went up and through, we'd gone through the crash in 2000s when um, the stocks, no matter what we did, they weren't gonna make it. And we had really low, um, escapements those years, but as you were talking about on the earlier slide, sometimes when you have really low escapements, you get really high returns, and we did in those systems. And it wasn't necessary anymore when, when that plan went away. And then we just happened to have this issue with the, between the earthquake and the changing weather. Um, it's been harder and harder for it to freeze up up there for us to really get those escapement surveys in. So we did have to discontinue doing the surveys. Um, we do still fly them and look, but we don't do the stream survey completely like we used to because of the climate change has, has caused some of that. Um, but there does appear to be less fish in there than the production that was prior to that earthquake. Um, so I don't, I don't know if it was a complete failure. It's like overridden by other things right now with the overall, when we found out that even with those years of the the really low production, how much actually came back off of those, and then um, the production that's going on now with with uh, being even though it's a little bit lower than than it used to be, the overall Tanana is still doing really well. So, hope that helps. Question from panel member Stan Ajutli, uh, senior. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, co-chair. Um, yeah, uh, Jeff, with you know. I think like technically all the work that you have done on porcupine, I think um, uh, you've done um, a lot of work and congratulations on all the work you've done technically and putting all, uh, all your effort into doing what you can for porcupine stocks um, as on technical level. But on, on the other hand, what the message is here is from uh, that we, that happens every year with the porcupine stocks is that Here's the circumstance and situation of the porcupine stocks. Their their the run is basically the same as as the um, as the main stem run main main stem run as the other chum. So it's hard to basically manage for that stock whether whether it's uh, I, I did or not. So the situation is the same every year for porcupine. So basically, that stock is the. Um, is basically um, left to its own, you know, ability to survive as a star. And for that run size, and they just have to manage to do that every year. At one point, it was down to 5,000 and 10,000. So uh, resilient as they are, they're making, they're making a comeback. But at some point in time in the future, we will probably lose, um, you know, one year or two years of the cycle because like um, the history is the same and repeating the same message I've done over the years is that the, the, um, some of those stocks can be fished out in one day 
in the ocean or or on the Alaska side through those numbers that are 5,000 to 10,000 at some point in time. So point is that the message is still the same and the situation hasn't changed. So um, on technical, what, what I would suggest is um, there's nothing that we could do in the interim immediately, but uh, for the JTC is to look at um, the, uh, when the peak run is, is in September the 13th. So if you can backtrack from there to look at when that's coming up through um, the Yukon River and possibly at some location down the river when, that, when, when the peak of that run is coming up Porcupine is to allow a passage for that to come up to maintain that run, uh, the, uh, the stocks to get the chum to get to the, to the spawning grounds. Our, our harvest for, for, uh, for chum on porcupine on the Canadian side is definitely a limited number. And on the American side, once you hit the porcupine and come up there to Alaska border, there's, um, at this point, there's no fishery. So in that sense, from that point, from the mouth confluence of porcupine, it's easy to manage to, uh, to uh, fishing branch to the spawning grounds. So, and, but from there, from, from there down, I think it's from there to the mouth, it's um, definitely within a treaty to look at how we can deal with it. So I would suggest something like that to look at uh, how we can manage those stocks in terms of um, the peak, when the peak run is coming up, if JTC or can come up with any solutions to bring back to how we can uh, as to how we can manage uh, the peak run for the chum, would be my suggestion. Thank you. Further questions from panel members? I have one comment that I'll offer up, and I appreciate that this is uh, preliminary, but certainly looking ahead to uh, future years, and we've been talking a little bit about management measures to achieve uh, treaty objectives for the, the fishing branch stock. Um, and I'm specifically picking up on Dennis's question earlier around the potential for uh, shifting, we'll call it uh, fishing, pressure or fishery effort uh, onto other stocks in order to protect uh, some of the weaker stocks. You recall that, that comment. Um, so my observation is kind of piecing together a few items from the, um, the fall chum salmon uh, presentations that we've received this morning and uh, understanding that in the earlier presentation we have yet to receive the uh, subsistence harvest information, but certainly based on commercial fishery harvests, uh, the number of sh uh, chum salmon harvested in U.S. Uh, commercial fisheries that's been reported uh, was lower than average and lower than prior years. Um, and that wasn't necessarily due to restrictions per se, but uh, I believe what was referenced was that uh, fishers had achieved, if you will, or, or caught sufficient fish uh, in, the, in the summer chum fisheries and then uh, you know, met their needs harvesting chum or Chinook salmon earlier on in the season. So uh, I compare that, so basically even though there were fairly liberal fishery opportunities, uh, fishery participation was less and by extension harvest was less than perhaps what was expected or anticipated by management. And I couple that with some of the, I guess you could call it preliminary genetic information where um, Porcupine origin stocks were actually overrepresented this year compared to the average at 6% compared to the long-term 4% average. So where I'm going with that, piecing these uh, uh, pieces of information together is that uh, fishery management measures were in place to allow for a greater harvest than occurred. The harvest was in fact lower based on the information that we've received to date because uh, I guess fishermen or, or fisher people uh, met their needs by uh, directing fisheries or successful fisheries at summer chum and Chinook salmon. And so as a result, harvest of chum salmon was less than what was potentially expected or provided for through fishery opportunities. And uh, likewise, the um, uh, chum salmon stocks in the porcupine and by extension fishing branch were greater are represented great at a greater level than they have been on average. 
So all to say the resulting effect is not achieving escapement uh, is obviously an outcome that's unfavorable and not something that we want to see. However, because the shifting effect of fishery efforts onto other stocks and species um, basically reduce the magnitude of uh, the potential consequence of full fisheries on fault chum salmon, if you follow my logic. So um, the outcome at Fishing Branch is better than what we should have expected given the fishery opportunities that were provided on fault chum salmon. Uh, in the U.S. So we'll kind of keep that in mind as we look ahead to future um, years in our preseason meeting when we review management measures for, uh, for the coming season along with the, uh, the preseason forecasts and outlooks. So, so with that, uh, we'll perhaps take a, a 10 minute break and I'd like to thank Jeff and Bonnie for your presentations and we'll resume in 10 minutes at 10.40. So thank you very much. <laughs>